David. Thank you, David. Great being with all of you, and it's um, it's a great honor to give a lecture in in Alan's honor, and I hope he and Vicky have an opportunity uh, uh, to listen. Uh, my disclosures: stock ownership in Vitae, and I'm on the IDMC of a number of AstraZeneca trials uh, today. So we're going to uh, go through a kind of a whirlwind of high-risk disease, node-positive disease. When we talk about node-positive disease, we really have to categorize it into clinical N1 prior to treatment, and then we have to think about those patients that are treated and have node-positive disease. So we'll talk about both those populations a little bit. And it was very funny as we went through those cases, the, the correct answer of every tumor board in 2022 and 2023 is PSMA PET. Uh, you know, whatever the question is, that's the answer. And uh, I, uh, I really enjoyed the lectures earlier today. So, but as we think about node positive disease, let's uh, review a little bit of literature. And I thought this was an excellent uh, study. Many of you have seen it, 764 patients with intermediate to high-risk prostate cancer uh, who were candidates for prostatectomy at UCLA and UCSF. 277 had a radical prostatectomy and a node dissection. And 27% of the patients had pelvic nodal metastases discovered at node dissection. So very high risk group. And again, the results were positive in 40 of the 277 patients, or 14%. Um, two of 77 and seven of 277 for pelvic nodal, extra pelvic, and bone metastases. And that brings the sensitivity, specificity, positive negative predictive value as listed. We've talked about relatively low sensitivity, relatively high specificity, and positive and negative predict predictive values of 75 and 81%. In this study, they had three independent uh, readers, and I won't go through the specific data. This is the study uh, cohort analysis, the full study population. On this side, the number of patients that had radical prostatectomy, the three blinded readers. And what's very interesting, if you look at the PET-N1, the 40 positive patients on PET, 30 out of the 40 had positive nodes. So pretty good specificity, or excuse me, positive predictive value, 75%. And again, in this N1 PET group, uh, PSMA PET group, 30 positive nodes. In the N0 group, 45 positive nodes. 19% of the N0 PET patients were node positive. 81% negative predictive value. Well, negative predictive value 81 sounds pretty good until you're talking to a patient and you're, and you're trying to use PSMA PET to select whether we should do a node dissection or not. That negative scan cannot reassure you. You must, if the patient is already a candidate for a node dissection, in your opinion, in your practice, you should still do a node dissection. This is what I ask you to pay attention to, Dave. Dave and I uh, dis disagree and argue about this at the tumor board. Um, so in summary, the gallium-68 PSMA PET's really revolutionary for the assessment of prostate cancer patients. For men with clinically localized disease, sensitivity 40%, specificity about 95% uh, uh, for nodal metastases. However, the relatively weak negative predictive value, 81%, means that patients with a negative PSMA scan and high-risk clinical features will still have positive lymph nodes at a significant rate, and the study was 19%. Now this is too busy for you to read, but I just am making the point that this study was included in the, in the bullet of the updated NCCN guidelines. Again, recommending to physician to not omit a node dissection based on PSMA PET, based on that result. So I, I applaud the NCCN guidelines committee. They're, they're usually quite quick at uh, including recent literature, and that's an example. That was just included this January. Okay, let's go through some, some studies that you're probably familiar with. Um, and again, in this background, when we think about a large randomized trial like the SPCG, the Scandinavian Prostate Cancer Group 7 trial, think about how many of these patients might have a positive PSMA scan, and think about the stage migration that will be in place in future high-risk clinical trials. So in this study, 875 patients with clinically advanced, locally advanced disease, T3. Uh, PSA had to be under 70. 90% 90 were D'Amico high risk. Got combined androgen blockade followed by flutamide versus that same endocrine treatment plus XRT. And this is one of the best designed studies that really proved that for clinically localized high risk disease, treating the primary is critical. And I would say today with modern imaging, many of these patients are probably at least N1. And again, this is the 
death from prostate cancer, endocrine versus endocrine plus XRT, and this is death from any cause, highly positive study. Okay, let's look at other evidence. How about retrospective reviews? This is the NCDB review of positive node patients without distant METs, newly diagnosed N positive patients between 04 and 2011, comparing retrospectively ADT alone versus ADT plus radiation. They did a propensity score matching because, of course, there'll be a risk difference between these patients in a retrospective analysis. And they found that ADT plus radiation was associated with 50% lower five-year all-cause mortality, hazard ratio of 0.5. So the conclusion with all the flaws and potential biases of retrospective study, value to treating the prostate in node-positive disease. Could this be one of the sources of disparity in the United States? You're familiar that still the risk of death from prostate cancer is about twice as high for black men in America, that differential that was recognized now 30 years ago in SEER data persists today. Is this one of the zones of, of uh, bias? Interesting study, again, looking at the NCDB, a large group of patients with N1 disease, a different date interval than the previous study, looking at outcomes of black versus white men and stratified by income. And what they found was that older age, poor insurance, and black race were associated with less receipt of local treatment for N1 disease, and that was associated with a mortality differential. So this actually could be one of the domains. Not treating high-risk prostate cancer as effectively could be a domain of inequity in the United States. So our research group, and this is really work uh, led by Dr. Brett Rose, one of our outstanding radiation oncologists at UCSD, looked at the Vinci database uh, asking similar questions, looking at clinically node-positive patients in the VA healthcare system, non-metastatic prostate cancer treated with ADT and ADT plus radiation, and again looked at prostate cancer specific and all-cause mortality, did an elegant competing risks regression analysis, and I'll show you the results. Um, ADT and radiation was associated with improved prostate cancer specific mortality, particularly in the group with the lower median PSA. There was a wide median PSA of this group and the lowest half risk of the group, uh, there was real value to treating the prostate. The higher PSA group, there was less value. So let me show you the graph. This is the whole population prostate cancer specific mortality, ADT plus radiation versus ADT alone. And this is the all cause mortality, uh, similar ADT plus radiation versus ADT alone. When we broke up the groups by PSA level, however, this is the group with the, and there's nothing magic about 26, that was just the median of the cohort. The lowest half of the patients in terms of PSA are represented here, and the highest half are represented here. So it appeared that the most benefit to treating the prostate was in patients with node positive disease, but with a PSA under 26. And again, all cause mortality, uh, again, this is the higher PSA and lower PSA group. So we did a similar analysis looking at patients who'd had surgery for clinical node positive disease at the VA. Uh, database. And again, the Vinci database, for those that, of you that aren't familiar with it, is a national database looking at all of the patients enrolled in the VA uh, electronic health record. There were only 78 radical prostatectomy patients for clinical N1 non-metastatic disease. And we looked at radical versus radiation and hormonal therapy versus hormonal therapy or observation. Similar sort of analysis, same research group. And what was interesting is that when you looked at radical prostatectomy, it was associated with better prostate cancer specific and all-cause mortality with really impressive hazard ratios compared to uh, uh, hormonal therapy alone. When we compared it to the ADT and radiation, there was no significant uh, difference in prostate cancer specific or all-cause mortality. And so if we look at the graphs, this is non-definitive treatment, ADT alone, and this is radical prostatectomy. This is prostate cancer specific mortality and all cause mortality, big difference in all cause mortality. And again, um, this is ADT and radiation uh, versus radical prostatectomy. 
And again, uh, there looks like there may be a slight advantage, but these are essentially overlapping confidence intervals showing no statistically significant difference. Again, making the point that at least retrospectively when looking at clinical N1 patients, treating the prostate makes a big difference versus ADT alone. Okay, and we're all familiar with Stampede. Now, this is not an N1 cohort. This is an M1 cohort. But again, I would challenge us to consider how these patients would look after a PSMA scan. So all of you are familiar with a complex and elegant study. It's already been summarized a couple times during this meeting, different elements of it. Over 2,000 men with newly diagnosed M1 disease in Switzerland and the UK randomized to ADT versus ADT plus radiation. The radiation was uh, sort of an interesting uh, radiation uh, treatment algorithm. But basically half were in the control arm, which is ADT, and half in the radiation arm. Median PSA 97, median age 68. Again, 40% had low metastatic burden, 54% high metastatic burden. And in a pre-planned analysis, the patients that were treated with prostate radiation had improved failure-free uh, survival, hazard ratio of 0.76, it was well tolerated. And because this was a pre-planned subgroup analysis showing that low metastatic burden did benefit, uh, this is considered level one evidence that treating the prostate is effective for M1 disease. Again, these are the, the graphs from that study. Overall survival, no significant difference. Failure, free survival, statistically significantly different in favor of treating the prostate. And again, overall survival in low metastatic burden, failure, free survival, low metastatic burden, and this is high metastatic burden where there was no difference in outcome. So the other thing that we have really discovered is that now we're shifting a little bit from high-risk N1 or M1 disease, treating the prostate, to patients who have a radical prostatectomy and are discovered to have node-positive disease. And something that seems rather obvious but has really never been described in the literature until just the past couple of years is that actually having an undetectable PSA after radical prostatectomy for N1 disease is a very favorable factor, and those patients do very differently than even if you have a low detectable PSA after radical prostatectomy for N1 disease. This is research led by one of our excellent residents, Michelle McDonald. And again, we had a large group of patients in the SEARCH database, which is a, uh, a database of uh, VA surgical patients primarily. We had 124 N1 patients. And we looked at their PSAs at six weeks, and 46% of the patients had a PSA that was undetectable, 44 had a PSA that was detectable. And so interesting that when we looked at METS free survival of those cohorts, uncontrolled by additional treatment, many of these patients went on to get ADT and radiation, that initial PSA was a strong predictor of METS free survival. That was a very small cohort in search. This, was, this study was repeated in a really elegant uh, way by Dr. Briganti and their group. They have over 1,000 men with N1, 1,000 men uh, in Milan who've had a radical prostatectomy with pathologic N1 disease. And there's quite a bit of literature based on that large cohort. So he actually repeated, their research group repeated this analysis. And again, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve of the patients with an undetectable PSA. This is years. Um, uh, going out to eight years, undetectable PSA versus detectable PSA. So that first PSA for N1 patients, very important. And again, this is uh, cause-specific mortality. Okay, so pathologic N1 patients with a first post-op PSA that's detectable are a very high-risk cohort that uh, uh, deserves additional imaging and additional salvage treatment. First post-op PSA, uh, it may be helpful in predicting outcomes of these patients. Okay. Now, this will be the last large study that I review uh, as we're kind of wrapping up, but I find this one really interesting when trying to decide, okay, if someone is pathologically N1, how should we manage them, and where is there evidence around that? In this cohort, there really is not randomized trial evidence. This is the largest large retrospective analysis of a group of uh, N1 patients from three tertiary care centers uh, uh, who were treated uh, with differently, observed versus lifelong 
androgen deprivation therapy versus androgen deprivation therapy and external radiation, looking as primary outcome, overall secondary uh, outcome, cause specific survival. So this is the largest N1 cohort ever published, 1,300 patients. And again, this green line is radiation and uh, androgen deprivation therapy. The blue line is ADT alone, and the red line is observation, showing that the patients uh, who were treated uh, with salvage ADT and salvage radiation did better. And again, what's interesting, this is the hazard ratio, and you look at the magnitude of the benefit of adjuvant ADT and radiation versus ADT alone, when we look at overall survival and cancer-specific survival. So surprises from this excellent retrospective analysis. Many patients with node-positive disease did quite well. The treated patients had a 75% cause-specific survival at 15 years. So node positive patients after radical prostatectomy, you know, is not a death sentence. Many of these patients respond well. We knew that from, from uh, the Messing trial. It was published in 1999, but it's, uh, it's still true today. Lifelong adjuvant ADT was associated with an increased risk of death from other causes compared to observation. That is the first time I've seen that com compellingly presented. So what this means is that lifelong ADT reduces prostate cancer-specific mortality, but when you look at overall mortality, it adds cardiovascular risk, and that may mitigate the benefit. So the higher-risk patients appear to do better with ADT and IMRT, and that included men with up to four positive lymph nodes, T3B and T4 disease. So the conclusions from the whole presentation today, there's value to treating the primary in T3 high-risk disease. That's supported by both retrospective analyses and well-designed prospective studies. There's value to treating the primary in T3 and N1 prostate cancer patients. There's value to treating the primary with radiation therapy and low metastatic burden M1 disease. We should all be supporting Brian Chapin's SWOG trial so we understand the interactions of, of radiation therapy and surgery in that cohort. The threshold of metastatic burden where local treatment is effective and useful is not well understood. Again, as I mentioned, there's a cl clinical trial underway, a uh, SWOG trial, that Brian Chapin's the PI that I think we should all support for M1 patients. And pathologic N1 patients benefit from salvage IMRT and ADT. Uh, we, we wait for patients to have a PSA recurrence because in modern node positive surgical patients, I didn't show you the specific data, 25 to 30 percent will be long-term disease free and we want to save them from additional treatment. But as soon as a, a patient is recurring after N1 resection radical prostatectomy, uh, I'm a strong advocate for ADT and IMRT. That's the conclusion. Again, uh, my pleasure being with you and thanks so much for the kind invitation, David.